Hi, everyone. I'm Arlene, and this is Linda, and this is Dr. Terry Orbuck. So this is very exciting. This is our last episode in February, and this was the month of love. As you can tell, I have my hearts on. <laughs> Appropriate for you, Dr. Okay. Terry. <laughs> I work for you. So um, this month, again, was about the month of love, and it was about relationships. So we covered family, uh, relationship, friendships, acquaintances, and now with Dr. Terry, we're going to cover romantic. So I want to give um, a little bio. Dr. Terry, or AKA is known as the love doctor, which is great, is a world-renowned relationship, relationship expert, date and relationship coach, an author, a speaker, a professor, a research scientist and media personality whose science-based advice has helped thousands of people find and create the loving relationships they deserve. We all deserve, right? She is also the director of a landmark study funded by the National Institute of Health, where she has been following the same couples for over three decades. That's incredible. Dr. Orbach is widely published in scientific journals and the author of Five Simple Steps to Take Your Marriage from Good to Great, which I've read, <laughs> uh, Finding Love Again, Six Simple Steps to a New and Happy um, Relationship. Her latest book is called Secrets to Surviving uh, Your Children's Love Relationships. This is great. I recommend this to every parent out there to read right? Because our example is to our children. If we want healthy relationships to go on, they learn by example. And I found this out in my own life with that happening. Dr. Obuk has been featured in such publications as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, Women's Health, Time Magazine, and has appeared on the Today Show, MSNBC, ESPN, Huff, Huff Post Live and CNN. She also teaches a science-based relationship coaching certification course through the Global Love Institute. And for more information, please go to drterrythelovedoctor.com. And for everyone out there, we will have that information um, listed below. Our wonderful production angel, Victor, will add that on to the end. And you can order these on Amazon? Yes, yeah. I have. Them. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. So, Dr. Terry, I'm so excited. We've been waiting for this. I thank you so much. Dr. Terry has just gone through a bout of COVID, which, um, you know, we all think that it's left the planet, which it hasn't. It's taking on different forms. So we all need to be aware of that. So, again, thank you. And the show is yours. You're going to talk about romantic love. Oh, thank you for inviting me to speak about romantic love. As you mentioned, um, all of my advice and books are based on this really great long-term research project. So it's science-based. It's not just my counseling or coaching. It's not just my own experiences about love and relationships, but it's science-based information and advice on real people and real relations. It is such a rich, wonderful study. All of the couples got married in 1986, and we've been following them now for over 34 years. Wow. So it's a wonderful project. And once the couples get divorced or lose a spouse due to death, we continue to follow the individuals. So I'm not only interested in what keeps people together and happy in a relationship and what breaks people apart, but if they no longer are a couple, how do they cope and adjust? And then who they partners and who doesn't? So it's a wonderful project. And as you mentioned, Arlene, I have three books. One is on the happily married couples, five simple steps to take your marriage from good to great. One is on those who are no longer in a partnership and that's called finding love again and then the last one is based on the parents how did they set a good example and what kinds of discussions did they have with their children <laughs> well the age is that we kind of all collectively you know I don't know how old you are but anyways I'm probably the oldest one here um that wasn't a really good foundation <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. And that's true. I mean, one of the things I found is that most of the people in my study didn't have any discussions with their parents about relationships, about love, about sexuality, and they didn't observe anything in their own parents. 
So that was my first question. What kinds of discussions did you have with your parents? And the majority said none. We did not talk about relationships or love. I'm going to interject quickly. Um, what I said when you, you know, the book about the children surviving your children's relationship, and that is a per your children see the example. We all see the example of what we, when we're young, we're like sponges that absorb everything. I saw for me, because my first marriage, you know, wasn't great. And I heard my daughter, she was in grammar school and she had her first little crush love and she was in her, in her room talking to, you know, her little cutie pie, right? And I heard her saying, well, da da da. And she's like yelling at him. And I'm going, I'm outside the door going, and I, I, it stopped me in my tracks. And I said, oh my God, where is she getting that from? And I said, me, me, that's me, or what she saw. So mm -hmm. that's very important. Very important. I think from my experience growing up, I was very fortunate. My father is a psychiatrist. My mother's a therapist. Oh, wow. And so <laughs> we sat down at the kitchen table and talked about relationships all the time. And in fact, I, I kid with my parents all the time that I didn't want to talk about relationships so much. I wanted to talk about anything else. But when my father got home, he spent about 10 minutes with my mom first before he would even talk with us as children. And my mom worked outside the home too, but she came home earlier. So I learned very quickly to prioritize my romantic relationship, which that's my expectations, which when I talk about the first really important thing that makes happy, healthy relationships comes from us, not only our background. And as you said, Arlene, what we learned as children and adolescents but what are our expectations about love and relationships? One of the things I found is that the number one thing that breaks couples apart is what I call frustration. And frustration is the difference between what you think you should have in a relationship, which are our expectations, and they come from our parents, religion, the media, romance novels, and what actually happens in our relationship. And so the larger the gap between our expectations and our realities, the more frustration. And frustration eats away at happiness in our relationship. So the number one thing I encourage people to do is to make sure that they're setting realistic expectations. Because we all have those should statements. My partner should know what's in my mind or <laughs> passion should <laughs> exist. 24 seven in my relationship, but the realities of our relationships really don't meet those expectations. So it's really important to set realistic expectations. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And this show is about also, it's called Beacons of Balance. So it's about balancing because we all have the dark, the light and it's making the choices. So I think when we do get in a relationship and this is with any type of relationship, even friendships, family, as you said, the expectations. So we're here. And if the other person, you know, they're in their little world of reality of what their perception and what they grew up with. So theirs is different. And it's like, ooh, you know, yeah. So I think the key also is communication. Communication is yeah. that's That's a great topic to talk about, Arlene, if I, if I could sure. just talk Do about communication for a second. Up. Because when we ask the couples, the two partners, we interview them separately as individuals and we interview them as couples. And we interview them as every, every year that they're married, right? And when you ask couples, do they communicate? Not surprisingly, everybody said yes. We communicate, right? But when we delved deeper into what that meant, for the majority of couples, that means talking about who's going to do the grocery shopping. Who's going to pay the bills, do the laundry, pick up the kids. And when we're talking about communication, that's so important for relationships. That's not what I call real communication. Real communication is all about talking to your partner about your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, your stressors, what's really going on in the core part of who you are. So what I've developed is what I call the 10-minute rule. And it's really important to practice that 10-minute rule every single day with your partner. And that is spending at least 10 minutes talking to your partner about something other than work, 
family or children, who's going to do what around the house or your room? And so when I tell that to couples, they say, oh, no, what are we going to talk about? Right? What else is there to communicate about? Or, wow, that's not very normal. Maybe I should try it. So what do you guys think about that? My situation is so different. It's kind of foreign to me on communication because I was raised in a pretty violent environment mm -hmm. and I was hurt by a father that I thought was supposed to love me. Mm -hmm. And I was told to shut up, you know, and you can't think unless you think what I think. He was kind of a bully. So my life involved getting in relationships and blowing them up because I was angry. So because I didn't love myself, I really had no business going into a relation. I should have never got married mm -hmm. three times. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I'm and damaged. Yeah. You, well, I, I think oh, that, that you're not I, I was think damaged, damaged back then. I was damaged. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. I think that one has to be really ready for a relationship. Otherwise, what happens, as you said, Linda, is you get into relationships that confirm your sense of self, which exactly. wasn't very positive, and trust in others, both the ability to trust and know if you can detect it in others is the number one step in a happy relationship. If you don't have the ability to trust and you don't know how to see if others are trustworthy, then you get into relationships that confirm mm -hmm. that people aren't trustworthy. And exactly. when you've had trauma, like you have, I you just mentioned, Linda, then I think we doubt ourselves. We don't yeah. know if we can trust and we don't know what signals we can really think about in terms of if somebody is trustworthy. But I do right. think change is possible, Linda. I think we can overcome trauma in our childhood. Oh, and I we have. can learn to trust yeah. and figure out the signals for someone who's trustworthy. Well, I like, I have a lot of friends and stuff. I have no desire to ever be married or anything again, but I have good, solid relationships with people and I trust them. So my argument, Linda, would be is that a marital or romantic relationship is very similar to our friendships, our family relationships, right? relationships with work colleagues, and that in all of those relationships, trust is needed. But the same kinds of processes are evident in those other relationships as in a romantic relationship. That's true. So if you trust others, like friends, you could also trust romantic partners. Right, right. I'm not, I'm sort of in that place in my life that I'm not, I trust a lot of people, but I understand humans are humans and not everybody. It's not about you stepping up to the plate for me at all. If if you've got some issue that you want to stab me with, go ahead. Because at the end of the day, I move forward. Unlike before, it would stop me in my tracks. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's, that's, but you know, I had a hard time. I still do a little bit because I was bullied so much with people who are too on me. You know, I can't deal with people. I prefer being by myself with people that are constantly trying, you know, I need you to do this or do that. And people that are expecting stuff from me, even though I want to give, there's a part of me that resists it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? Did, did oh, you I understand that? that completely. And you brought up a lot of very interesting topics. One is independence versus yes. interdependence, right? Yes. You sound like you're very independent. Mm -hmm. And in a relationship, people can be interdependent, not dependent yeah. on one another but interdependent, mm -hmm. as well as you brought up the topic of being alone mm -hmm. versus feeling lonely. Yeah, you I don't can be alone and not feel lonely. You're happy, satisfied, right? With life and with other people in your life. Yeah. You can also feel lonely, right? Not satisfied when you're in a relationship. Oh, yes. I was and lonely I all the time in my life. Yeah. We want to be where we don't feel lonely and mm -hmm. we're interdependent. I yeah. think that's a good point that you brought up, and especially for people to check in with that. Because I remember I always surrounded myself. Well, I always do. I love people because I was 
sheltered as a child. But anyway, that's another story. And um, I always had parties. I always had a lot of people around me, even, you know, my marriages, because I'm on my third. And, um, but I would have put all these things together and there were a lot of people. And yet I'd be sitting there and I was alone. Yeah. I mean, I loved my, I loved the people and I love what was going on. But then I would look at certain couples. There weren't too many that were very happy, you know, very happy and functioning. I thought, you know, and I looked at them and thought, I don't have that. And it no. kind of saddened me. It saddened me. And um, with my last, because I'm on my third marriage, but after I got divorced the second time, I took five years uh, for myself. Mm -hmm. And I read a numerous amount of books on, you know, because they say you repeat the same thing. If you don't really heal and go inside to see what's going on, you bring the same it might, the package may look dressed differently, but it's the same thing inside. It's exactly the same. And I chose, I had two relationships that were addictive. They were addicts in their own, own sense. I grew up in an addictive family <laughs> and I had big abandonment issues with my father Right. And I had trust, big trust issues. In fact, when I got together with my now current husband, I said, the first thing I said to him is I said, listen, and I am an independent woman also. <laughs> and I said, I have my friends. I like to try. I like to be with my friends. So you have to understand that. And I said, I don't trust men. That was a big thing for me at the time. I said, I don't trust. I said, if you do one thing, it puts up a red flag, then another one will go up. And, and, and if that happens, Bye. I'm not waiting. <laughs> well, you know, in this long-term research study that I've been talking about for over 34 years, one of the things that partner said is that me time, which is exactly what I think you're describing, me, is so important to me. And when I get me time, whether that is by myself, doing an activity with friends, with my own interests, right? Or just sitting across the hall with my partner, but not talking. Me time, private time is so important. And what I found is that that led to when people get me time and they're satisfied with that me time, that led to happy, healthy relationships. Yes. So we forget, like you said, I mean, that that me time is so important right. to us and who we are. Even if you're a couple, you gotta Even be. Even if you're a couple, you have to be separate. If you're a couple, one of the things that the couple said during the pandemic, when people were isolated and in their homes and not working outside the home, was that even when they were living with a partner inside their apartment or home, they still needed me. And again, it could be in the same room, in corners, just reading books separately, but just coming into yourself. Who am I? What do I need is so important. Happy, healthy relationship is not just about the two people. It's about what each person thinks about themselves. Well, it starts here, as we said, and we've said this before in other topics, you know, we have to really go in and love ourselves. And it's hard for people. We don't understand what that means, but it goes back to healing those wounds that we come in with as children, you know, what we see and we get so wounded and we bury those. And I know I found for myself, a lot of women that I know that have gone through um, divorce and men also, I'm sure you could agree with this, Dr. Yeah. Terry. Um, it, like when I was on the dating circuit, everybody is, I would look at a parameter for a man that I was talking to see where their anger level was. If they talked horribly about an ex-spouse or their mother or their family, I said, that was a red flag because how are they going to handle a new relationship? They would hold those, people hold those anger things. I know women that were divorced for 30 years and they're still playing that same record around, you know, oh, they did this, they did that. They can't let go of it. Right. That you need to let go of the past whether you uh, have had a traumatic experience in your past or not. We all need to let go of the past so that we don't repeat the same patterns, as you said, Arden. We can see new people for who they really are, as I think you've said, Linda, and not compare the past to the present. So regardless, anyone listening to this about your past, you have to let it go. You do. And be fully present so that you can move forward. One yeah. of the things that I work with, with divorced men and women, is to try to let go of that anger mm -hmm. or to try to let go of that pining away. Like I want that person back or 
shoulda, coulda, bid it in something, right? How do you let go of the past and move forward? And one of the things that I teach people how to do is to do what I call change your billing statement. And this is just particularly in terms of divorce or a bad relationship that ended. So it is not about um, abusive relationships mm -hmm. and it's not about violence or anything that has to do with the violence in a previous relationship. And what you want to do is instead of saying it's your fault or the partner's fault, your you know previous spouse's fault, you want to do what I call we statements or we blame statements. So instead of saying you weren't emotionally mature, I wasn't emotionally mature, we had different views yes. about what it takes to be in a relationship. And when we can start developing or creating those we blame statements, we mm -hmm. let go of the anger, you, he, she, should have done something. We let go of the pining away and the sadness. I didn't do something. And we begin to become neutral and let go of the past. Yeah. So those we statements are really important to be fully present and move forward. I had a client that had been in a 17 year horrible relationship and met a divorced finally and met a wonderful man. And she said, Linda, he's so wonderful. But, you know, after the heartache from my first marriage, uh, he wants to get married. But after the heartache from my first, I said, isn't that interesting that you allow your first husband, he still has power over you where you feel you don't deserve happiness. Why would you do that? Why would you allow him? Because forgiveness involves m making sure nobody like my dad when I finally forgave him. He has no more power over me. It's not about literally forgiving him. You don't forget, but I did. I let him go. And then he had no more power over me. I like that a lot. Yeah. I say, right. Forgiveness doesn't mean you don't forget. Right. Or you excuse the bad behavior of somebody else, but you allow the power that that person has over you. You right. let it go. Let it go. Very good point. Exactly. You need to forgive a lot in the past so you can move. Forward. I think in the first place, as we say to love oneself, we also, the very first step also is to figure, forgive ourselves. Yes. Forgive ourselves because a lot of times we could beat ourselves up. Like, you know, I look back, you know, and I was at a place at one time saying, oh my God, I wasted all these years. And I knew way back it wasn't good. I should have acted on it then, but for whatever reason I didn't. And you start beating yourself up for that. And you have to let go of it. There's a reason for everything, you know? And I also think in a lot, every relationship, I, I always said we're like crystals. We have different facets. So you could be with somebody, and maybe you'll agree with this, Dr. Chair, I don't know. Do you ever truly know a person truly? I think all of us, we have a little compartment that we hold here to ourselves that no one knows about, <laughs> even no matter who we're close with. So I think during different times, people show different facets of themselves. And you could be with somebody for so long, and this could be a, a friendship, and all of a sudden it turns a little bit and you see another face on them and you go, whoa. <laughs> It happened for me a lot of times when I went on vacation with people. That really shows up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I know people actually that have got a mirror and they go on their honeymoon. And I don't know if, if you've heard this also, Dr. Terry, they go on their honeymoon and they have a big blow up fight. You know, here they just came off of their and marriage. I think it's because I mean, um, you really want to see someone in many different facets. Yeah, but that's um, your thing. That's your problem. They that what I'm sorry. They're a separate entity. They, right. they are who they are. And so when people start judging people about, oh, well, gee, blah, blah, blah. It's actually, that's your problem. You you got to let people go. You have to be, if you don't love yourself, nothing else is going to come to towards you but chaos. So mm -hmm. you have to be firm. And it's okay. Some people just have attitudes, you know. Exactly. And also, I think it's important to understand whether or not that other person and you, if you're starting a relationship, can handle stress and conflict well. That was another predictor of happy, healthy relationships. And for some people, they don't do stress well 
but you Mm. never know that because you haven't seen them in different facets of their life and in different situations. That's That's one of the reasons why I think a lot of the reality love or relationship shows those couples who get together, you know, on an island or in a beautiful (laughs) place of the world, it's because they didn't see that partner when uh, they got into a car accident. Yeah. When they're on been on a plane for five hours and it's on the runway. When some other stressor, they lose a job. They don't have any money to pay a bill. So those are the real a yeah. partner in all of those different areas of life situations. Then you truly know whether the two of you can handle stress and conflict well. And in beginning of any relationship, we have those wonderful endorphins that are going off and, you know, they could crunch potato chips and drop nuts on the floor. And you're like, oh, isn't that yeah, wonderful? Yeah, you don't see it. But then after you're with them for a few months, you're like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> and that occurs in all relationships. Yes. I mean, one of the yes. things we find when we look at research on relationships, that's called passionate love. And yeah. passionate love inevitably in all romantic relationships, all, I say that and I underline it and I bold it <laughs> if I could with my mouth. Um, it happens at least 12 to 15 months of being with someone. So it can happen two months, but up to 12 or 15 months. And then you need to reignite that passion and excitement because passion and excitement those hormones, that excitement, that passion is fueled by newness and you begin to know the person. It's fueled by surprise. And once you're with somebody, less of what they do is surprising. And third, it's all about arousal. And our bodies cannot handle that passionate love. No, 24 seven. Yeah, every day, sure. Oh, so we things, would be exhausted, right? So many things come into play, illness, everything, you know? But you can reignite the passion. Oh, I, I like believe to- I believe that. Yeah, the newness, that. surprise, and arousal. And you have to check in every so often with the other person and see what's going on, you know? Because we all change. That's the other thing that I definitely found about the couples in my study is that everybody changes. And change doesn't have to be negative. So if one day religion is important to you and the next month or year or five years down the road, it's not, instead of saying to our partner, you're not who I married, you're not who I thought you were, do like what you said. We check in, do a tune-up. We take our car to have an oil change every three, five, seven months. We exactly. need to make sure we're doing the same thing to someone we're living with or having a romantic relationship. Right. Check in. Talk. How have you changed? What's new? What are your stressors today? Who are your best friends? If you won the lottery, where would you travel to and why? Mm-hmm. Things and individuals change over time. Sure. That's an inevitable part of being It changes, changes life. If we don't change, it's stagnant, it gets rotted, and it falls, it's done. Yeah, which is something else I found. Boredom (laughs) and being in a rut also eats away at happiness in a relationship. So as you begin to feel that you're in a rut with your partner, whether you're doing the same things, whether you're not talking, whether you are watching the same TV shows, going to the same restaurants or vacation spots or whatever, Gently rock the boat a little bit. Do some different things so boredom doesn't set in. And sometimes it changes so dramatically that you do have to walk away. Or, Absolutely. right? Because it's too tough. To- if you can't stay in toxicity, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that'll kill but you. Too. I would argue that if you're checking in regularly right. and you're not right. putting your relationship on the back burner, right. the change will be slow. There'll be communication with the change. And you'll understand the implications of the change better. Doesn't mean you're going to stay together, mm-hmm. but at least the change isn't, oh no, I didn't even understand. 
what's going on. I didn't know that that was going to happen. So let's, I, we have a couple of questions, I think. Um, the first I'd like to ask you is what are the, uh, what are the keys that make a relationship work? I mean, we touched on them, but what are the, the key, um, the major ones that you would say? Well, first, make- it's looking at the positives rather than the negatives. One of the things we know is that we could always find things that are wrong or negative. So we want to focus our attention on the positives because when we look at positivity and the positive strengths in our relationship, it motivates us to move forward and we can handle the negative stuff. Second, it's all about the smallness. Really, we want to look at the small things. People always say, don't pick your, you know, pick your battles. In relationships, if we don't address the small things, they become big things and they become hard to unpack. So if it's the toilet paper or the toilet seat or <laughs> how to put dishes in the dishwasher <laughs> or who's going to sweep or pay the bill, right? That's so like, true. Yeah. <laughs> Little yeah. things before they count become really big. Yeah. And third, yeah. another really important thing is what I call affirmation. You want to wake up every single day in all of your relationships and say or do something so that that other person feels noticed. And yes. You can say, I love you. You're great. You're my best friend. And this is true of friends, colleagues, family relationships, romantic relationships. We all need to be needed. And so if we can show the people in our life, especially our partner, but everybody, that they're seen, valued, cared for, and we notice them, it will make a significant difference. And this is even more important for men than it is for women, because as women, we're lucky, Arlene, Linda, myself, we were taught from a very young age, compliment, show you care, say I love you, express concern. For men, at least in the United States, North America, I would say, they don't get taught to yes. affirm one another. So then they really need it and crave it in their own. Yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. I see it. So I think those are all the keys. Yeah, that's great. Happy, healthy religion. Linda, you have one? Uh, Linda, yeah. Have- who are romantic, men or women? Ooh. Men are more romantic, Linda. I know it goes all against the myth and the common sense notions. It turns out that men are more likely to believe in love at first sight than women. Men are more likely to believe that love conquers all. So if we have a problem, if we just love one another, we'll get through. Which is not true. And women don't believe that in general. And that you need love, not lust but love in order to have pain. Right. So men are more romantic in their beliefs, unlike the media shares or portrays. Right. I had my third husband had gotten out of a, like a 30 year marriage. So he was so hungry and he wrote me sonnets and was just bought me all kinds of jewelry and was just kind of overwhelming. And I remember telling him, take me off that pedestal because I'm going to come crashing down. Because what he was doing was satisfying his own vision of what romance should be. And we only lasted in marriage about a year. It, it so when you have that ideal because, image, that's yeah, hard he, for you, the other person. Yes. And I couldn't keep up with that image he had, you know. Was that your last one, Linda? Yeah, my last. Yeah. Your last one, yeah. So... Dr. Cherry, in your opinion, what are the key factors that will be the demise of a relationship? I think it's not paying attention to the small things. Um, I think we're taught that if we can make these grand gestures, like you were talking about, Linda, like write sonnets and give gifts and take my love away on a vacation, those huge things, or, you know, Like at a baseball game, I love you, Linda. Yes, yeah. Huge gesture, right? But it's not about the big things. It's actually about the daily, small, consistent things that really matter. So when those small things aren't there, 
we find that relationships and love and happiness and satisfaction slowly get eaten away, slowly yeah. die, because we want to wake up and have those little things. Maybe just a touch, a hug, a kiss. It may right. just be a thank you for the coffee that you got in the morning or for going grocery shopping. My husband, by the way, puts gas in my car. I don't mm-hmm. like putting gas in my car. And it's such a small thing, but it's, but it's so nice, yeah. important. When I get into the car and I see the tank on full, well, I think, oh, how wonderful. I love that. Right. Right? That's so, so sweet. It's about the small things. So that's what eats away at happiness and satisfaction and tears of us. No, I agree. You know what gets me is that bachelor show. All these people all in love with this one person in a matter of weeks, hysterical and crying. What is that about? I think that's about how that idealized image of love, right? Okay. We're on an island. I'm going on this wonderful one-on-one date where I'm in a helicopter or bungee yeah. jumping or on a cruise ship, right? On this gorgeous boat. And everything is idealized and romanticized. Yeah. And as long as that relationship follows that script, follows that situation, I begin to think I'm in love. But if we yeah. really think about it, you know that. Love is about knowing that person. I know, and you don't know nothing. You don't know anything. And, and you're on camera, so point. everything is camera. Well, it, was, it was sensationalized. I think one good thing, one aspect about it was good, though, is that they showed older people. Mm, so, you know, your life, your life doesn't have to be over. Do you know what I'm saying? It's never and too late. It's to never, me. ever. And, you know, um, I worked medical and I used to cover nursing homes. And, I used to have to check their wristbands because so many times men would be in with the women. <laughs> it didn't yeah. matter. It didn't matter what age they were, 90 or whatever, they were together. And it showed that people wanted that, you know. We all need to be needed. We all need to yeah. be loved. We all need to be seen. Yeah, we, we want the man. 100 or 13, right? Right. Or younger right. Even. Um, and I'm not just talking about romantic love. We all need other people and love in our life. And by the way, when we have love of all kinds, studies show that we are healthier over time. We're less likely to be depressed and anxious, and we're more likely to exercise and eat well. We're more likely to sleep better, fewer headaches, and feel better as well. And by the way, that's the love of everyone, not just romantic love. Right. Linda, did you have any any other questions or? Well, she pretty much covered a lot yeah. that we talked. Um, about. I have one, another one. How how do you feel, uh, Dr. Jerry, that technology has changed what we're looking at right now? I mean, I guess it would be for well, I guess it'd be for older people to relationships. You know, mm-hmm. if somebody you know wants to become romantic and that, I mean. There are the dating sites and that. I did happen to meet my husband. I mean, that's the venue that I use because, you know, years ago when I was growing up, would you go to dances and bars and stuff like that? And um, there wasn't that anymore. So, Well, the dating apps and dating sites became very popular in like 2000, Mm -hmm. 2001. And what it did, I think, Arlene, is help us expand the possible others that we might meet as well as it allowed us to get our feet wet. So if we experience a breakup, a divorce, the death of a spouse, we could get out there and we could type and message people and more than one person, and we could do it in the confines of our own home in our PJs, right? So what it did was it sped up the process of us meeting people and getting in relationships. And I think it was really wonderful and it allowed people to meet others and so many others. But what happened, I think, because of the pandemic yeah. is that all of us became dependent on technology. Right. All of us were back in our homes and we weren't meeting people face to face and we weren't doing natural things and we weren't meeting people outside the confines. We weren't working outside the confines of our home. 
Mm -hmm. So what's happened, I think, because of the pandemic is that people now are yearning and craving for face-to-face time. And if they're going to the dating apps and the dating sites, they're getting very frustrated because now there's too much choice. And people are going, well, if I like this person and I form a relationship with them, what will I miss? Who will I miss? And are there better people out there? I felt it was another another avenue of disappointment, though, for people, too, because I know myself, but then I found out how it was going. You would start communicating with somebody and you would have back and forth. You know, I like to do it quick. I wanted to, OK, let's meet for coffee. When I first started doing it, I was meeting people out of state because I didn't want anybody around the area. Yeah. <laughs> I just so. Um, but then when you start, you know, you you talk and then all of a sudden it would drop off like poof. Nothing. So then you're you're perplexed and you feel hurt again. Like, oh, did I say something? What's wrong? Did I, you're not knowing that they're with somebody or whatever. Who knows? But right. And, and it had nothing to do with you. People are no, talking to not. many people. Of right. Course not. But you kind of and you yeah. but immediately decide it's something with me, something. So it's another dimension with. of where years ago you didn't have to. I think a quick face to face date is very important. Yeah. That you can start online, you can start on an app. And by the way, it's very popular, 50 and beyond, right? So yeah. it's a way to meet others and begin the process of gathering information. Is this person right for me? And then if you say yes, to meet face to face and continue to gather the important information to determine whether or not this person is right for you and the relationship is the right. But now people are getting very frustrated and yes. people are going back to the traditional ways of matchmaking, of um, meeting people at groups and activities and being fixed up by others from friends and family. There we go, Linda, we could be Yentas. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I did act as a Yenta when I was working as a headhunter. I used to match up people back then. It was, oh, it was funny. What would you list, the last thing, what would you list of the most important elements in a relationship? Mm, the most important elements mm-hmm. are trust. List. Yes. Going both ways. Mm-hmm. The both people are trustworthy and both people have the ability to trust. Communication, but real communication, as we described. Affirmation and compliment. So waking up every single day and either saying or doing something so that person is noticed. Handling conflict or stress well, which includes compromise, by the way. And I think compromise has been getting a bad rap. All that means is we are coming into the middle or we are doing something outside the box. It does not mean that I am dependent and I will no longer have my independence or I can do what I need or want. It means coming into the middle again or doing outside, something outside the box. And then lastly, it would be adding excitement and romance and not getting into, as we talked about, that what or that food. I think those are the essential ingredients in a happy, healthy relationship. And what other thing that you had mentioned is expectations. Yes, that and we expectations. Place expectations on we people um, either either way. You know, I in my past relationships that I was in, I always said, well, if the person really knows me, being my spouse, right, they would know when they were gift giving, say, for whatever, what I would like because they should know me. And then I would get something and it fell short. So finally, what I did, is I said, you know what? I'm buying my own, <laughs> I'll buy what I want, you know? And, and yeah. that satisfied, I didn't have expectations anymore. Then I was surprised if I got, you know, and, and my current a- husband's really good. He really, and it really blows my socks off when he gets something. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, he really pays attention or knows me. So that's-, that's such that's- a common expectation, Arlene, that people have that someone should know what's in my yeah. heart and know what I would want as a gift. And I think that happens at any age because, you know, and I have older friends and they, they say after 40 years together, you think they would know. And why do they still do this? And I said, give it up. 
Give it up. It's not going to happen. Just give it up. <laughs> do, do it for you. Do it for yourself. Do it for yourself. Don't do wait. Or sit down and tell your partner, here's what I need every single Valentine's Day. Here's what I need on my birthday. Or what I would like or, to do. Yeah. Why don't I tell you what I would like on my birthday right. or Valentine's Day? And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. But one thing, you know, I know you've written all these books now, and you know, it'd be, I'm just putting this out there because I'm from the older generation, baby boomers and everything. You know, it'd be really good is to do a maybe book or whatever for the baby boomers and the older population, because those relationships that I see with friends, family, whatever, are changing because somebody could be together a multiple number of years, maybe not even, but they're older. And then the one partner gets sick and then they become a caregiver. And that's so stressful. And they love the person, but you're so frustrated and um, it's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. Or people yeah. that are older coming together, getting even married at 80 years old, 85, 90, whatever. They still come yes. together. Oh, I love that idea. In fact, my next book is called Love. <laughs> loss and aging <laughs> oh there you go hey did i get this telepathically right, from you exactly I... it arlene Woo. you went down psychic i got it i didn't even know that you got it you got it <laughs> thank you i know you have to run thank I, you we so, so much appreciate you me. coming on and i hope in the future we'll have you on again we'll have um, to talk especially when your book when's that book coming out that's for i'm still writing i'm in the okay. writing phase I'll, I'll contribute if you want some info. Okay. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you both. What a wonderful discussion. And I would love to come back. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. Dr. Love. And um, we'll have Dr. Love's information down below. Victor will add that on. And to everybody, Linda. Will uh, be the change. Be the change. You want to see. Be, we always say, be the change you want to see. And from our hearts to yours, we love you. Um, it's all about balance and for joy, peace, harmony, love. Have peace. You have it all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you're feeling better too. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you both. I have to Bye. shut this now. <laughs>